have taken over 50 hours or what felt like enough time to earn a doctorate of medicine, but I have finally emerged victorious over Ultima Underworld, the Stygian Abyss. I'm happy to report that despite some abstruse 90s design, Underworld has aged rather gracefully. It was so ahead of its time that it's easy to forget this game came out almost 30 years ago, as it greatly influenced Western RPGs like the Elder Scrolls, as well as laid the groundwork for immersive sim design philosophy. So today, I want to give you a comprehensive review of this often unknown but essential cornerstone in gaming history, as well as provide some tips for beginners so you can get the experience you deserve. So let's get stuck in. Underworld's origins began in the mind of designer Paul Nurath in 1989. He'd been unimpressed with previous RPG's graphics and realism and formulated the idea for a project simply called Underworld, hoping to create the ultimate dungeon crawling simulator. As one gaming news outlet might report, he wanted you to feel like a dungeon crawler. So Nurath promptly started up Blue Sky Productions, which would later be known as the Legendary Looking Glass Studios. Their Underworld demo impressed publisher Origin Systems so much that they offered to work it into their Ultima franchise. Development carried on for a year with much experimentation, the team working on many different simulation mechanics, many of which were scrapped. The lack of results a year in irked Origin, and the dark cloud of cancellation began to loom over the project. Origins War Inspector believed in the project, however, saying the team was creating serious magic, and that the sense of doing something incredible was palpable. So he jumped at the chance to become the game's producer and guided it back towards completion, keeping the team on track and repairing the relationship between Blue Sky and Origin so that the game released in all of its glory in 1992. His substantial contributions were honored in-game by the inclusion of a Spectre named, you guessed it, Warren. So what kind of magic did the boys create? Well, let's start with the narrative hook, which is delivered in a delightfully campy opening cutscene with some of the worst voice acting you'll ever hear. Not to mention a criminal mispronunciation of the word Stygian. You play as the Avatar, the hero from the previous Ultima games. The wizard Garamon summons you for aid to the Stygian Abyss, but when you arrive, you're mistakenly accused of kidnapping a Baron's daughter for a demonic ritual being conducted by Garamon's brother Tibal. Several tense hours later, you were dragged before Baron Ulrich. What news, Corwin? Forgive us, my lord. A foul creature escaped. A score of escaped chase, but it fled into the Stygian abyss with poor Ariel. If thou art truly the Avatar, then perhaps thou canst offer hope. None here can survive the Stygian abyss and rescue Ariel. Corwin shall take thee to the abyss. Return here with my daughter and thy innocence shall be proven. It's a gloriously contrived setup when you think about how unlikely it is that the Baron doesn't seem to recognize the six-time world-saving champion, but also simultaneously feels no need to give you anything to aid you on your quest. But rules are rules, so a humble start to your journey it is. What you're getting yourself into requires some context. Before the events of Underworld, a noble leader named Kabiris sought to unite the eight cultures of the Abyss by distributing eight magical talismans amongst them. He died before he could finish his work, and soon wars broke out and the talismans were lost. You arrive to find the Stygian Abyss run down, brawling with dangerous monsters and splintered factions, only some of which still honor Kabiris's utopian vision. You soon realize that retrieving the talismans is integral to your own quest, and you're drawn into conflicts that long predate you. What I like most about Underworld is that while you're certainly beginning to matter more to the residents, the Underworld is beginning to matter more to you. I'm sure Nietzsche would have something to say about that. Based on how much System Shock, Bioshock, and all the rest would iterate on this defunct Utopia setup, it would seem they have something to say to Underworld as well, like, thank you for paving the way. The similarities between them all are very striking. One such similarity is Underworld's dark and atmospheric environments. Underworld was one of the very first games to achieve an almost totally 3D game world, actual 45 degree angles and wall corners, minimal voxels and screen warping when looking upwards, varying levels of elevation, dynamic lighting, and texture mapping. John Carmack famously created his own texture mapper for Catacomb 3D in 1991 after seeing the technique achieved in an Underworld demo. And while he technically got to market first, Underworld applied the technique to gaming for the first time and, unlike Catacomb 3D, even managed to feature a basic ceiling texture. While the default darkness level proved so dark it gave me headaches and prompted me to install a brightness mod, I was still enamored with how foreboding exploration felt because of how much depth the shadows have, not to mention the moody midi soundtrack. <laughs> There are so many strange and interesting tonal choices here, and it was one of the first soundtracks to contextually adapt to the level of danger you're in. Charmingly, footstep sound effects are just two low piano keys alternating, so they blend right into the soundtrack organically. Direct hits in combat even sound like a guitar twang. 
it works somehow, and because all the sounds are synthetic, it all feels cohesive. All right, so the game looks and feels great, but how does it play? Well, let's create a character and find out. Well, like the little bitch I am, I started my game on the easier of the two difficulties and chose the Druid class, which are supposedly the best options for beginners. You'll choose your name, gender, dominant hand, and class, which each have their own specific skill affinities. These include, but are not limited to, armed and unarmed melee, spellcasting, repair, lockpicking, stealth, swimming, and bartering. The higher your skill level, the better the odds you'll succeed at using that skill, like scoring hits in combat or successfully casting spells without them backfiring on you. There are some nuances. Unassuming skills like lore allow you to identify quest items and potions so you're not throwing away important stuff by accident or ingesting anything poisonous. Surprisingly, attack sucks because each point invested in it is half of what you'd gain if you just spent your point on your preferred weapon skill instead. You should also choose your preferred weapon skill early on and start leveling that right away. Weapon variety is balanced in that swords and maces are plentiful, but axes are the most powerful and the most rare, so choose wisely. Whatever you pick though, melee combat is simple and satisfying. You click and release to attack and get a cool animation and damage effect. You can do different attack patterns depending on whether you click the top, bottom, or sides of the screen. Magic is also a big part of Underworld, although it's one I specifically ignored in my playthrough. Spells are performed by arranging rune stones in a specific order in your HUD to create food, fire energy blast, and more. Many rune combos are revealed through books, notes, or NPC conversations, but even more are left up to your own experimentation to discover. Now, this sense of discovery should be exciting, but many of the best runes were in easily missable side areas or came so late in the game that had outgrown their usefulness. Additionally, some potions and scrolls grant you special abilities like healing or levitating that offset the need for runes. Most damningly, it was just far easier to kill everything with my axe than keep the required distance between me and my enemies so that I could cast a damage spell. Now, however you defeat your enemies, you'll gain XP and be able to level up once you've earned enough. In order to upgrade a skill, you must know the mantra that corresponds to that skill and type it in. The first shrine has several mantras written on the wall for quick reference, but they may not correspond to the character you wish to play as. About midway through the game, I started to find mantras for the skills I wanted, but had I waited this long to find them, I'd have an underleveled character, or I'd have just been spending my points on random skills just because they were available. But don't feel at all guilty if you want to look up the mantras that correspond to your preferred build, so you're leveling up in a way that promotes your enjoyment. Now, if you're a hardcore, above-medium player, I have nothing for you, because that would be off-brand, and I can't disappoint my public like that. They mean too much. So you've made your character, hopefully to your liking, and now you're ready to explore. There's a ton of shit to pick up, like weapons, armor, torches, and jewelry. And to equip them, you have to drag the item to the appropriate part of your character portrait. Like a sword to a hand, helmet to a head, that kind of thing. Your class determines the amount of weight you can carry, but no matter which class you pick, Deciding what to take with you and what to leave behind are constant considerations. The long-term value of items isn't always obvious either, like the spider silk in the first level that's a necessary crafting material 20-30 to 30 hours later. Fortunately, your map is a big help in this regard. Underworld's map is one of the best you'll ever use. It autofills your progress as you go, and you can write as many notes as you want on it to mark NPC locations or where you left items you couldn't carry you can come back for them later. Super convenient. Now you'll probably also notice the control scheme's a bit, uh, unique. Underworld was one of the first games ever to let your mouse do all the work. You used to have to click and hold down on the corners of the screen in order to move in that direction, but thankfully GOG has added WADX support for movement, which will feel right at home for Thief players. You still have to use the contextual menu that modifies what your mouse click does, though. There's a speaking mode for NPC conversations or to utter level up mantras, the grab function to pick up items, the look function to identify objects, a combat mode, and finally an interaction mode used for unlocking doors or other objects. Underworld also lets you tilt your view up and down using the 1 and 3 keys, and offers a jump and a super jump that takes you farther but is harder to control. Platforming comes up quite a bit actually, and it's somewhat frustrating to control, but the mere existence of these options was a huge evolution for first person games and RPGs. The same is true of how you can hold down the shift key while moving to go faster. Make sure you use the speed adjusting control when levitating as it'll really help you not get stuck on the environment. Oh yeah, this game has flying. <laughs> Any Morrowind fans out there can tell you how much fun that is, and it's no less fun here either. Not to mention this level of freedom in a 90s first person RPG was just unheard of. 
So whether you're flying, walking, or swimming, your journey will take you through all eight levels of the abyss, which are each populated by unique cultures and races, all with their own motivations and belief systems. As the avatar, you'll engage in multiple choice conversations with NPCs in order to find out where each other's allegiances lie and whether you can work together with them. One good example occurs in level one, where the gray goblins ask if you know their sworn enemies, the green goblins, and the tone of your answer and how you characterize the green goblins will determine if the grays let you into their compound or not. Once inside, you can only talk to their leader if you ask his wife's permission first. Similarly, similar, similarly, similarly, Gold Thirst, the leader of the dwarf like mountain men, can be bribed with gold to reveal a password to his vault. Characters are vibrantly written and brimming with personality, and they're also highly responsive, even desirous of being treated like real people. They're also quite funny. There's a goblin who warns you not to fall into the large latrine like so many other of his goblin associates have done before. A troll named Rostak insists on calling you Rodriguez. Uh, and remember this guy when we look at Ultimate Underworld 2 as he'll show back up again. There's also a harmless madman named Zack who obsessively collects light sources because of his fear of the dark and insists on calling the player Zack and calling himself the player's name. Not only are the characters fabulously drawn as far as RPG NPCs go, but the quests that emerge from them are often intricate and clever. While there is certainly a subset of objectives that require other quests to be done beforehand, these tend to relate to the main quest line, and you can travel between levels at will, taking on whatever challenge you prefer in whichever order. One of my absolute favorites happens in the realm of the Lizardmen, who have imprisoned a mute wizard. To free the wizard, you must learn the Lizardman language and reason with him, but the only person who knows a language is the mute wizard, though you have to feed him Lizardmen phrases you've heard and hope you understand his attempts to act out a translation of the words for you. This required me to get out a pen and paper and start writing down a translation key for each new word or phrase I learned, and I really enjoyed the intention this one required to solve. I won't ruin any more side quests for you, but suffice to say there are plenty more fun and interesting ones to experience. I only have one issue with Underworld, and that is the tension that occurs between the non-linearity of Underworld's geography and design and some very arbitrary puzzle and quest solutions that don't feel fair to the player. Essential main quest items are stuffed in these random corners of the map, with few hints as to their location, and even sometimes when hints are dropped, they're done so long before you encounter that item, they get lost in the shuffle as you initiate a ton of other quests in a short amount of time. Other interactions require extremely specific items to be traded with NPCs, and there's often very little to no context that NPCs even have the potential for this interaction, much less what they'd want in order to unlock the rewards. I won't rule out that maybe I'm just a cotton-headed ninny muggins, but Underworld undermines the lessons it's taught the player about playing close attention to NPCs' desires, and it also fails to provide necessary context for quest solutions sometimes. Fortunately, that's really the only issue I have with the game. Now while we're taking Underworld to task a little bit, there's an aspect of the game's legacy I want to discuss. The pervading notion that Underworld is the first true immersive sim. This is an opinion even M-Sim Legend War Inspector holds. Now certainly there's unavoidable design overlap between role-playing choices and M-Sim's emerging gameplay scenarios that encourage creativity. But I submit that Underworld is a prototyping of M-Sim design rather than an actualization of it, because it's so scripted in how quests play out and doesn't commit to any reactive systems with branching cause and effect chains. For instance, one quest requires you to gather ingredients to make a troll's favorite stew that you can trade it for his dragon scales, or you can just try your luck at killing him and taking them. This is a pretty classic binary RPG choice like the do or don't detonate Megaton's bomb in Fallout 3. To me, it doesn't reek of M-Sim design because it was essentially choose what's behind door 1 or door 2, and there's not an occasion for unique outcomes based on player imagination. Now, I'll grant that Underworld's attention to mundane details echoes an M-Sim or a survival game. You'll need to eat regularly in order for your sleep to regenerate your health, and you'll have to turn off your torches before you sleep or they'll burn out by the time you wake up. You can even cook popcorn by combining a torch and an ear of corn together. You can break down almost any door except for sturdy or massive doors with your weapons or bare hands. <laughs> Talk about brass knuckles. Some locked gates can be opened if you poke a wooden stick through the grating and flip the switch on the other side, a gimmick seen as late as Arcane's Prey in 2017. Beyond that last detail, however, there's not much in the way of emergent gameplay scenarios that reward player ingenuity. Unless we're categorizing most role-playing options of choosing this weapon or magical power, or just one multiple choice option in conversation as emergent gameplay, or we're painting any immersive game world as an M-Sim, you know, what literally every 3D action adventure strives to be, then we need to be more stringent in what we require of Underworld in order for it to qualify as one. Now, if all of this sounds like semantics to you, let me give you an anecdote about a particular quest that I think sums up the conundrum that I'm grappling with. 
I was told I needed to require a magical item in order to beat an otherwise insurmountable boss, but in order to get that item, I had to get into a prison and retrieve it. Unfortunately for me, the game glitched and would let me into the prison, so I just had to try my luck with the boss and see what happened. He was tough, but I defeated him, and he dropped a key that let me into the prison. This clever back door that let two streams of action feed back into each other organically so that I could still experience content in reverse order smells an awful lot like an emergent scenario that M-Sims like Dishonored are known for, but it also felt like the game lied about the stakes and broke its own lore to do so, since I beat the boss without the item I supposedly had to have. Just ask at many walkthroughs that are on the internet, whether YouTube or in written text form, and they'll tell you, you need to get this item so you can beat this boss. Now, do with that anecdote what you will, but to me, Underworld's often brilliant in its free-flowing design, but ultimately feels like a hint of things to come, rather than the first functioning incarnation of MSIM design. Just let me know in the comments if you understand my reticence, or if you think I'm just barking up the wrong tree. I think this topic definitely bears revisiting once we get to System Shock, and Thief, and Deus Ex, and all the rest, so this won't be the last video that discusses the truly fascinating design philosophy found in those games. Now, the fact that we're even discussing Ultima's design and legacy in such detail is a testament to its beautiful balance of discovery and scope. To recap, it was the closest to fully 3D game world that existed, with 45 degree angles and multiple planes of elevation, and was the first game to implement texture mapping. It also appears to be the first RPG and or first person game to include jumping and flying. Its narrative hook of a well-meaning utopia that fell apart can be seen in so many games since, from System Shock to Bioshock and many more. Its non-linear approach to quest completion and its emphasis on intuitive NPC interactions contribute so well to making the world feel reactive and vibrant. The somber beauty of the world and the high difficulty of some objectives reminds me very favorably of my time with the Soulsborne games. Like those games, if you stick it out and don't feel above consulting walkthroughs to get to the good stuff, you're going to have a great time and really start to see just how many precedents this game set. I'm reminded of Warren Spector's words after he saw Underworld's first demo. Do you realize the world just changed? Having now seen it in action, I can see exactly what he meant, and I hope you'll do yourself a favor and give it the same chance to enthrall you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.